hey, check it out. Um, you know what? Um, every every pastor, you know, everybody has their their little uh, sayings. You know, um, I have a lot of them actually. There's been a few through the years with Denverisms and stuff, but. Um, one of the things I've always said from way back, way back, 25 years ago, you know, early on when I first got saved, is that there, there's a Bible study in everything. And I say that a lot. There, there truly is a Bible study in everything. Everything that we do, you know, if you kind of look close enough, events in your life, um, events in our country, wh- whatever, there's, there's always something you can find that's relatable, you know, in the Bible. And so... Uh, this weekend, as I was uh, doing my thing, you know, for Thanksgiving, like we all do, I, I happened to come across, I happened to notice something, and I started, like, taking notes, like, when was Thanksgiving, Friday? Thursday. Thursday. That explains why nobody was there. Um, about, like, Wednesday or something, you know, um, I went to Stater Brothers, because I was going to make uh, this... Uh, Mushroom roast beef gnocchi soup thing. Yeah, just, there's really no, there's no recipe to it. It's one of those, you know, instant pot things. And so, but I knew what I wanted to get. And, you know, I had my list for, uh, because I wanted the roast beef to have like uh, a mesquite marinade on it. So it kind of had a little smoky thing going on. Then uh, I wanted like sliced mushroom, mushrooms that I could slice into quarters. So I got the big ones, you know, so they're like the fours. And then uh, Tracy had like a box of little, uh, I think you call it baby bellas, the little whole ones. And I wanted to use those because they float. I don't know if you guys know that, but mushrooms will float, yeah, in uh, liquid. Because the gnocchi also floats. So, you know, I was already thinking with all the spices, when, when you open the pot, you're going to see these floating mushrooms and gnocchi and stuff, and it's going to look good. It's all, you know, about presentation, right? But while I was there, there was all kinds of people, you know, meandering around Stater Brothers with lists of ingredients and preparations for what they were going to be, you know, putting together and, and all the time and effort they were putting into getting all the right ingredients and everything for their, their big creation. So as I was watching all that stuff, I started thinking, man, you know, there's probably more to this story than just Thanksgiving here, which is the opening. We, what can we learn from Thanksgiving besides being thankful? Which we are. I mean, I certainly hope, you know, we all had a great Thanksgiving, by the way, and lots to be thankful for this year. Amen. In spite of a lot of things to not be thankful for, but nonetheless... Here we are. We made it through. So all these people are getting all this stuff together. They're prepping it, you know, and they're putting all this effort into buying their ingredients and filling their list. And then then the next thing that that happened, you know, you're cooking all that stuff and then you you bring it to wherever you're going. Well, we went to my son's house and and, you know, different people brought different dishes, you know, like happens a lot at Thanksgiving, the potluck thing. And so, you know, I had mine all ready for its presentation. Then, of course, the turkey, the ham. There was, like, a roast beef or something going on over there. And then some, like, candied yam thing going on with all the little marshmallows on top. And, you know, so you're walking by the table, and everything just looks so good, man. And you you just want to dive in, which we did. And we dive in and gorged out and, you know, ate way too much. But everything was so appealing that you wanted it. And, and as I was looking at all this food, you know, we're, we're supposed to be doing Thanksgiving and stuff, but I'm, you know, I'm in Bible study mode, man. I'm thinking, man, each and every person devoted all this time to, to get just the right stuff so it, it came out delectable and smelled great and it was appealing, this food. And everybody was just digging in and I watched everyone, you know, going out, shoveling the stuff on their plates, man, you know, and then going back for seconds. And then after we all were sitting down eating, we started sharing. And we, you know, people were talking, I was talking to my grandsons, you know, about things that they were thankful for, and other people were talking about other stuff and football games and, and all that stuff. But it was this great time of fellowship, just hanging out and talking to each other. And both of my, my middle grandson and my youngest grandson, as you know, we were talking about the various things we were talking about, the conversation steered towards Jesus. And we were having little conversations about that. And they they don't go to church like my granddaughters do, but they have they have a faith, you know. And so any chance I get, you know, I try to slide on in there just a little bit. And then by the end of the whole evening of eating and fellowshipping and all that, the conversation moved 
to Christmas time because that's the next thing that's coming up. And so everybody's talking about the, you know, we're talking about the Christmas dinners and Christmas presents, you know, and I think, you know, at some point maybe the Christmas list was going around, you know, the however, however that's all going to happen. But I noticed that the conversation by the end of that day turned to Jesus. And so by the end of the day, I had a solid Bible study in my brain. I just didn't know how to put it together. And so over the course of the last couple days, this is what I came up with. It's, I guess we could either call it turkey theology or Thanksgiving theology. It's probably better, right? Thanksgiving theology, thankful theology. I don't know, whatever it is. But this is what I saw happen on Thanksgiving. Let's open up a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit diving in and showing us cool stuff, Father, all that's all around us here, Lord, that we can apply to our lives, we can dig into your word, and we can find answers, and we can find reasons, and we can find all kinds of stuff for every little thing that goes on in our life, Father, because you truly do direct each and every step of our life, Father. We thank you for that, and tonight we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, to open our eyes and ears and our hearts to the message you have for us, in Jesus' name, amen. You ready for Thanksgiving again? Just Bible style? Here's your first fill-in then. The preparation. That I was talking about early on. The preparation. Now check this out though. Now, now we're not going to be talking about food here, right? And we probably already get that by now, right? We're talking about evangelism. Sharing our faith. And how we, how we can approach that and make the most of opportunities that come along. So when you put your brains in this thing, as most of you probably are pretty, pretty darn good chefs here, because I've eaten the food here that we've had, if you think about what you put into making a dish, preparing it, and serving it, and enjoying that with friends and family and things like that, try to get your brain connected with that and digging into the Word of God in a way that you can be prepared to serve up his word out there to a lost and broken world, amen? That's kind of the direction this is going. But before I start, I, man, I totally blew my turkey, didn't I? I got so excited about my thanks, Thanksgiving theology. We're going to uh, Frazee, Minnesota for the biggest turkey. Sorry, buddy. It's all right, we got Big Dan. There he is right there. That's Big Tom. He's 22 feet long. He weighs... 24, or he weighs three tons. He's filled with a steel skeleton and 4,000 fiberglass feathers. But before you go to the next picture, he goes to every parade. Once a year, they have a big parade that goes through town and stuff like that. Yeah, he does. Somehow or another, they put him on a trailer. And uh, anyhow, um, or the one just before him, I should say, the big Tom just before him would go on a trailer. And they were doing some welding inside his little steel skeleton. And they set poor Tom on fire. And this here, the last picture is, is, is Tom. He was reduced to a big pile of ashes. Yeah. And so the first pictures that you saw there are the new and improved Big Tom. He's the one that stands there now. And I venture to say that at three tons, that homeboy does not get on a trailer and go for a ride down no parade. All right. Okay. So now you've been to Frazee, Minnesota, which is, claims to be the turkey capital of the world. In fact, I don't know. That, that just is what it is. And a fun little fact I found on there that may or may not be true because not everything on the Internet is true. But I know, right? But there's a disproportionate number of politicians that have come up and from Frazee, Minnesota, the turkey capital of the world. It could be true. So the preparation, the preparation here. Go with me over to Romans 15 right quick, if you don't mind. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So the written word is where we're starting off here in the preparation. If you've ever read a recipe, you know what you're looking at right there? You're looking at a written word. That's what that is. And isn't it interesting that we pay so much close attention to recipes to get them exactly and precisely right? then we do sometimes spin it in the Word of God to make sure that we get it exactly right, right? But let me share something with you. Aside from many, many other things that the Word of God is, it's also a giant recipe book on how to share your faith with the lost and broken world. And all the ingredients are here. 
And all the ways to do that are here. And it starts right here with understanding the written word because it was there according to this verse here for our learning that through patience and comfort of the Holy Scriptures, we might have hope. And hope in what? Hope in being able to share our faith better than we do every year and just get a little bit better and a little bit better. But we got to read the word. We got to understand it. We have to spend some time in it. Look at, look at 2 Timothy with me real quick here. 2 Timothy 3, 14. But... You must continue in things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, and which is in Jesus, Christ Jesus. The preparation of it to, to share your faith. One of the biggest things that messes people up when they're talking about going out and sharing their faith and evangelizing, one of the biggest complaints that I get is I just don't know scriptures well enough to do it. And I, I understand that. I'm looking, I'm not really big on memory verses myself. I got a couple of them in here that, that I remember. But that's not that's not where the power comes from. You can have memory verses, although if you take memory verses out to a motorcycle event or something like that and you start rattling out Bible verses in the middle of a motorcycle event, you're gonna be as popular as a piranha in a hot tub. Nobody's gonna want to talk to you, man. But if those same verses, like, the, like this says right here, have been within us, and they're part of us, and we've lived them, and we understand what they truly mean, you can interpret that then, the way those scriptures have guided your life to help them. You speak it in your own language, not in the language of King James or Paul or anybody else. Have it, but before that can happen, we have to allow that to get in and absorb in, and not just kind of you know, glean over this stuff, but really spend some time like we do looking at a recipe book. And when we go through and figure out, I mean, you know, you can look at the recipe of something and, it, you know, it may have flour and cheese and cayenne pepper and maybe some Carolina Reapers and things of that nature and some mayonnaise. If you don't put the right amount of stuff in, all right, if you, if you put like a teaspoon of mayonnaise and like a half cup of Carolina Reapers because you're not paying attention to that thing, Right? And, and just so you know, my, my uh, ribeye, mushroom ribeye gnocchi soup had a dash of cayenne pepper in it. Just a dash. Because if, if I've, well, I've read other recipes for it, and it can be pretty brutal pretty quick. If I'd have just done like, you know, you take the lid off and you <laughs> shake it in there, it would have been like a one bite soup. You know, people would have taken a bite of that and spit it right on out, right? Also, I, I used a quarter cup of sweet Marcella wine in there as well. And, you know, nobody got drunk off my soup, you know, on a quarter. But that sweet Marcella wine adds this little thing, little flavor through there and stuff in the whole simmering mode. And I cooked it for like five hours, man, in a slow cooker. But if, if we... If we overdo a recipe on anything that we're, that we're making, we'll wreck the dish, right? Same thing applies here. Same thing applies to evangelism and sharing our faith out there in the world. We have to, we have to know and, and, and live the, the Word of God so that when we're sharing that stuff, we're administering it in the right amounts. Not too much and not too little either. Sometimes, uh, more often than not, when people do kind of get out there, they tend to lean on the negative side of the don't do this, don't do that. The Bible says you're not allowed to do this. You know, you're going to go to hell. And, you know, it, it's, it's real, uh, what is that, uh, brimstone? What? Fire and brimstone like that. It, and it's a real drag, man. I mean, it's true. It's all in there. And I do believe at some point everybody needs to hear the truth. But when you're first ministering to somebody, there's so much joy and beauty and victory and life and love and happiness in the Word of God that we can share with people that more than likely that's what they're hungry for and that's what they're starving for, not necessarily getting their teeth kicked down by some Christian that they probably didn't even want to talk to in the first stinking place. So preparation, that's the key, man. Fall in love with the Word of God. Doing those home studies, man. Go down to the Sela and you get those little books. They're like two bucks or something like that. It might be a book on Philippians, it might be on prayer, you know, any, any number of subjects, and they're like in the little kiosk thing, just grab one, man, and devote a month of mornings or evenings just to go through that thing just by yourself, you know, dig through that thing, and I promise you, you will, you will 
absorb what's what's happened what you're reading in that stuff and you'll be able to share even that little that one little book you can go out and do some amazing things with that one little book and what will happen is you'll start finding out man this is super cool this isn't as hard and bad as i thought it was going to be i'm going to go get me another one and then before long you know you got yourself a collection of those little things and you're getting yourself you're turning yourself into a royal recipe book to go out there and share your faith amen so the next thing that happened that i noticed was the big feast the big feast. And you know, there's a lot of feasts in the Bible, and we, you know, we've, we've been talking about those for a little bit. The, the, the feast in heaven, the, we've, we've talked about the, the feast of the, uh, what do you call those things? The festivals and all the food that goes into that. We, we've talked about a few feasts, but check this out here over in uh, Proverbs 9 with me real quick. Proverbs is a great book of wisdom, by the way. If, if you're looking for a place to start, because you just, like you just can't get into the whole Bible reading thing and all that stuff. Open up to the book of Proverbs and dive in. And here's a here's a little fun fact. You don't have to necessarily start at Proverb one because if like the date is what's the date today? Like twenty seventh or something like that. Twenty six. You can start in Proverb twenty six. There's thirty one of them, and you can run it to the end of the month and then go back on the first of December and start on one, and you can do one proverb every single. Month. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Anyway, check this out. I mean, every day. Check this out. Proverbs 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out of her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maiden. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Come and eat my bread and drink of my wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live. And go in the way of understanding. All that preparation was already done. Do you know what I was talking about there? Getting all the ingredients together, mixing them in the right proportions, cooking them at the right temperatures at the right time, and then the presentation of it. When, when it's brought out and people can see it, that's what this is about here. This is about us presenting the Word of God as spiritual food for a lost and broken world out there, man. And we don't want to bring them the hamburgers you actually get at like Jack in the Box, not the ones on the window, but the ones that are actually in the box. When you open the box and they're all smashed down and meat's hanging out one side that looks like someone picked it up off the floor or something like that. It's not appetizing. We want to present the word in a way that it's appetizing and it looks good and it smells good and it sounds good, man. And they're like, man, I, I want to take a bite of that as opposed to being repelled, like, you know, to go out there in the world and try to win souls with a plate of liver and onions. You're probably not going to get too far with that stuff right there, man. Unless some of you liver... Are there any liver and onion people in here? <sighs> okay, well, you know what? They have... They have... Classes for that. But anyway... <laughs> we want people to, to see what we're offering them on a plate as something that looks delectable. Something that makes them go, oh, man, that looks cool, man. We do it all the time, whether you know it or not. We do it with the battle wagon. When we set up the booth out there, that's what's happening, you guys. That whole thing was one big recipe. It's been a long kind of running recipe of being you know, created. But what it does is from across the parking lot or, or nearby, what they see is happiness, and they hear sounds of spinners going on like that. They see people laughing, and, and it's, it's, it's appealing. It looks good. It's something that they want to, they may want to check out in there and they get over there and kind of look at the smorgasbord of stuff. And as they're going down the table, it gets better and better and better. And then usually more often than not, when we ask them if uh, we can pray with them, they, they say, yeah. And these are people that probably, maybe they've never prayed in their whole life, man. But because they had such a wonderful entree coming up to that part right there, because the food was good and it was prepared right. It wasn't just some wacky, thrown-together mess, man. It was something that was appealing. And that's what this is about. They're saying she's already got all the, the, the meat slaughtered. The wine was mixed. The table's already been set. And now all you got to do is now go present it. She's going, hey, man, if, if you're lacking understanding, come here. If you don't get what's going on with the Word of God, if you don't really truly understand the whole thing about Jesus, come on in, man. You know, we're not going to beat you to death with the Bible or something like that. Just sit down and pull up a plate, man, and dig into some of this. Man, this is a, that big old 
roast beef over there. You know, we like to call that the book of Psalms, man. Take a big chunk of that one right there. Let me show you some cool stuff in there. And here's a really cool one over here in the New Testament. You get to the, the stuff that actually has the cayenne pepper. That might be a little revelation-ish, perhaps. I don't know. It's where the fire start to kick in a little bit. And she, and she, keep, she goes on and says, look, forsake foolishness and live. You know, look, there's a place to come to. There's a place with good food. It's wholesome, it's solid, and it's healthy, and it's, it's fulfilling, and it's satisfying, man. All the, all the junk out there in the world, all the fast food Thanksgiving that you might come into, there's, they may advertise, but there's no such thing as a McTurkey sandwich. That ain't turkey. I mean, if you guys eat that stuff, I'm here to break your heart tonight, man. But I don't even think that it's a fowl. I don't even think it's a bird that's in that stuff right there. It's, it's not real. And that's what the world has to offer them out there. Hey, instead of going and sitting down with a family and stuff like that, you know, let's go out and blow our money at lost wages or something in a casino or something like that. Let's spend our, our, vaca- or our, our weekend out there. This lady, or this, not this lady, but wisdom here is saying, look, if forsake all that foolishness and live and go in the way of understanding. Come on in, sit down, dine and break bread with us and just see what the Word of God has for you. And you'd probably be surprised that because the Word of God is a giant smorgasbord, actually, you know, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, there's all kinds of different things going on in the Bible. And, and even once, you, once you've seen the whole buffet, you can go back at the beginning of it and start over, and the buffet will look differently as you go through there because the Word is active and living. It's a double-edged sword, and it'll come at you from all different angles. And we want to be able to set that table right. Look over here at Revelation with me. We're not going cayenne here, I don't think. Let's see. uh, Three, where is it? Oh, here it is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him, come into him, and dine with him, and he with me. The table's set. It's time for the big feast. We We can set that table, and we can bring folks right to the table of Christ, man. And then there he is right there. And they go, you hear that knocking? Like, yeah, I hear that knocking. You're like, that's Jesus, man. And all you got to do is open that door and you can sit there and eat with him, man, and have a personal relationship and a personal meal with the Savior right there, man. But we're the ones right now. We have a, an, it's an obligation and a burden for sure. But it's also a privilege, man, for us to be able to prepare a table in the presence of our enemies, so to speak, those that are far from God, and bring them closer to Christ, and then let Jesus and the Holy Spirit do their thing, man. But we got to get ourselves a little bit more in this word, man, and not be so afraid of it, and not be so afraid of what we're going to say when we're out there, man. I can tell you, I'll tell you guys right now, all of you in here that have been Going to church for as long as you guys have, you have more than enough information written on the tablets of your heart to be amazing evangelists out there in the world. If you can just get past the enemy lying to you and falling for his okie doke, man, that you're not good enough to do it, as soon as you get past that little nugget right there and realize that, first of all, you're not going alone. You're going with the Holy Spirit, man. You're going in the power of the blood of Christ, and you have stuff already. You have your testimony plus many years of listening to the Word of God through teachers or videos or things like that or even reading the book. So before you cut yourself short on on how good a chef you are for the king, let me tell you, that's a lie from the pit of hell. You guys are like Chef Boyard, dang, (laughs) if you're just willing to get out there and give it a whirl, man, all right? And then the next thing that comes as we're macking down and all that stuff is the fellowship. Go with me over to Isaiah real quick. Let me show you something cool in here. It's been a really interesting book, hasn't it? We're, we're not quite done with it yet. We're kind of creeping up on the end there, but I think we still have some time left. But look at this. This feeling is the fellowship now. And, and again, you know, we're talking about Thanksgiving dinner. We all know we all gather together. But the fellowship is about hanging out with people. It's, a, it's about, sh- you know, the, the, the getting to know you stuff and, and not the cramming the word down their throat, you know, and brutalizing people in the Lord, but just building a friendship, becoming friends with some other human being out there in the world, just friends, 
and then allow the Holy Spirit to create that God space through this meal that we've just all partaken in together. And now the, now the conversation starts to go a little bit deeper now. And look what he says here in Isaiah 12, something four. And in that day you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among his peoples, make mention that his name is exalted, sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Now we're, we're moving into that, that phase of sharing who we are in Christ now calling upon his name, the name of Jesus. It's okay to use the J word, still. Declaring the things that he's done with his people, the things that he's done with me, the things that he's done with the people here in our church. Making mention of his name, that he's exalted above all things. And not because the Bible says so, although that's the, re that's the main reason, but because he's proven himself over and over and over through all the millennia that he is exalted above everything. Jesus Christ has done the work and he's proved himself. And we sing to him. That Remember that word sing is about beholding and it's about praising and worshiping, making those weird sounds, woohoo kind of sounds because we're so excited about our faith and we ought to be excited about our salvation and our faith, amen? It's an important thing. If some comet slammed into the earth right now and wiped out civilization as we know it, would you, would you be really excited? Like just a second before the comet hit, wouldn't you be like, woohoo, I'm saved, right? And what about all those people out there that are going to be cowering and crawling into rocks and aren't going to do a dang thing for them like we learned way back in the beginning of Isaiah? They're crawling into caves and all that stuff and there was nowhere to hide from the wrath that was to come. What about them? But just imagine that same person that crossed your path a couple days ago and you had this big old turkey theology feast. I think I'm going with turkey. Theology feast with them. And you know what? In that, they gave their life to Christ just before the comet came and squashed them into a pulp, right? And on home they go, right? This is known in all the earth. And you know what it is? There, I don't think there's too many places on the earth that haven't heard about Jesus Christ. You know, maybe... 30 years ago, you could say that's probably not true. But today, with technology, I can tell you, man, Jesus is everywhere, all over this planet. People have heard. And I, just so you know, between me, you, and the fence, fence post, I look at that stuff, and we're talking about eschatology and the end times and stuff like that. When everybody has an opportunity to hear the name Jesus Christ and make a decision, he's like, how is that even possible that the whole world can hear about Jesus? Well... And all of our smart brightness, we figured out a way to do it, right? We could just beam Jesus right into the darkest jungles of some weird place. And there he is right there, being taught to people that have probably never seen other humans in their life. I don't know. The Lord works in mysterious ways, right? Look at this other one over here in Philippians. Philippians 4, check this one out. Pretty familiar verse, but in the context of what we're talking about right now, fellowship after the big feast that we just had, after the big preparation that we had, that we put together and all the time we spent preparing our own hearts in order to prepare a spiritual meal, in order to present it to a lost and broken world, and then having that time talking, let's look at this familiar verse in that light. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice all the time. Keep your eyes open in your life. There's a Bible study everywhere. Everywhere you go, there's something going on. If you really take the time to look at stuff, you can be like, wow, man. You know what? I, that kind of reminds me of, I don't know how many times you talk to someone, you try to share your faith or you try to help someone get off the street. And we're doing all this homeless stuff. We're crawling in the bushes years and years ago and under bridges and stuff. And you try to you know, help people get off the street, man. And they, they come up to you and say, well, you know what? I just can't do it. It's just, you know, I'm never going to be able to be that way. Or I got things I need to do. I got people I need to see. And you're like, who the heck do you need to see, man? You're living in a cardboard box under there. There's like appointments and things. Well, I got to, you know, see my mom or something like that. There's just all this weird stuff. And then John 5 pops into your head because you all know what John 5 is, right? Do you want to get well? The dude at the well. And Jesus walked up to him and said, do you want to get well? He's like, oh, man, every time I try to get in the water, someone gets in in front of me. Wah, wah, wah. Big old can of wah. Right there. There's a Bible study in it right there. I mean, everything that you do. You can go out and do all this mad shopping that they're doing. Cyber Monday. Freaky Friday or whatever the heck they're, they're doing and stuff like that. Man, there's Bible studies and all that stuff, man. You can look at all those crazy people running around there. 
And you know what? Just the other day it happened to me. There's a crazy guy. I wasn't home. Probably a good thing, but I wasn't home. But I was over at Doc's resurrecting Lazarus, and Lazarus has risen, by the way. Yeah. And some crazy guy that, you know, lives in the neighborhood, in the park or whatever, he's a homeless guy, and he runs down the middle street doing karate chops and screaming at things that ain't there, you know, chasing demons around or whatever he's doing. Uh, whatever it is, he came screaming down the street and chucked a vape right through one of our front windows, and off he went, you know. I mean, what do you do to a guy like that? You know, you gotta, like, beat him up, try to talk to him, but he just disappeared. And the first thing that crossed my mind was that crazy dude on the other side of the lake. When Jesus and the boys got on the boat and they went across the lake and the dude came running out of the tombs with the chains on, all screaming mad and stuff like that. That's what popped into my head, man. There's a Bible study in everything. Everything. There's a Bible study. If you're willing to, or not even willing, but if you just think about this stuff. So he goes on like this and says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. What are, we, what are we requesting right now tonight? We're requesting that this meal that we've spent so much time preparing is received well to those that don't know Jesus Christ. We're, we're, we're giving thanks and we're requesting that, that we don't shrink back in fear, man, that, that we boldly share our faith, not mean or, or attackingly, but in a loving way that creates God's face. That's what this is about, man. He's like, don't be anxious about it. Don't freak out. He says it right here. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, prayer and supplication. You know what? There they are. God sent them. God sent you. The Holy Spirit's there. What do we have to be worried about, man? In fact, if you worry, you're a stinking sinner, which you're a stinking sinner anyway. But you're a double whammy sinner if you're, if you're worrying because Jesus said, don't worry. And if Jesus says, don't do it, what is that? And you do it, it's a sin, right? Okay. So he's going, don't trip on that stuff. Just with thanksgiving, to go, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that you put right in front of me right now. I have no idea what I'm going to do right now, but what I'm going to do first is pray, and then I'm going to move on in there because he says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Guard your hearts and minds from what? From the stinking enemy that's going to lie and say, you're not good enough. What makes you think you have anything to offer that person right there spiritually as a Christian? You suck. You're a stinking sinner, man. You're a, you're a hardcore hypocrite, man. I mean, you're really going to go try to talk to that person about Jesus. You ain't even walking in the faith yourself, man. Well, who do you think you are? That's a lie from the pit of hell, man. And that's what the enemy does to us, man. He tries to dredge up all the junk of our life and throw it in front of us. And why is he doing that? He doesn't care about you. He's not really trying to hurt your feelings necessarily. He's stopping the action that's going to happen between the Holy Spirit and that guy as if he could. But that's definitely what happens there. And God's going, look, you pray about this stuff. You give thanksgiving and go, Lord, I'm not even listening to that idiot over there, man. You guard my heart and my mind through Jesus Christ. I'm going to walk over there and I'm going to have a conversation with this other human being right there. And I'm going to bring this big old smorgasbord and lay it down in front of him, man, because I've been preparing and preparing and preparing for a long, long time. And I think I got a pretty good spread laid out for him. I think he's going to really enjoy this stuff. And all of a sudden, all the, the chaos and the static and the white noise that's coming at you from every side, it dissipates, man. And you get into that, that bubble, man, with the Holy Spirit, that God's face, and nothing can come at you and nothing can impact you. It's the way it works, amen? And then here's the last one. At the end of all this stuff, it always points back to the very thing that we started with, man, Jesus Christ. The whole point of all of this, man, is about Jesus Christ. It's always all about Jesus. You know what? Someone ought to make a shirt. It's all about Jesus, I think. There you go. See, someone beat me to it, right? Check this out. The Christmas. The Christmas. The, the Christ Mass. The gathering for Christ. The worshiping of the King. The worshiping of the, the, the Son of God. The one born of the virgin that Isaiah prophesied about. The Messiah, the King. Wonderful counselor. Look, look check this out over in, in John. The very beginning here in Big John. Chapter 1. 14 goes like this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. That's what we have to stand on right there with all this stuff that we're talking about here. The preparation, why spend all the time preparing? Why spend all the time to put a presentation of the spiritual food that looks so good, it smells so good, it tastes so good, it is good. What is the point of doing all this stuff? I'm already saved, man. I got my fire insurance. 
I can drop dead and fried chicken right now, and I'm going home to be with the Lord, man. The Bible says here clearly to be apart from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? So what do I need to put all this stuff into it for? Because the person that led me to the Lord did. He put all the presentation, he put all the preparation, the presentation, all that stuff, and brought it to me and laid all that smorgasbord in front of me. And he's passing down over street. He's at home with the Lord right now. And you know what? I took a big old bite of that roast beef right there, man, because I dig the Psalms. So supposing that Psalms is roast beef on the table, but nonetheless... That preparation worked for me. And I've led people to the Lord. I know that many of you in here have led people to the Lord too. So you clearly have a presentation. I'm just saying we can do it better. We can continue to get better. And the better we get it at our preparation, our presentation, and our food preparing that we're going to give to Him, the better we become. The more happy we become. The more peaceful we have. The more joy that we have. The more content we are in our lives as well. As the Word washes all the trash out of us, man. It doesn't, it doesn't reside in the same space, so you know. The trash is here, and the word is here. The more we bring in the word, the more it washes, the more the trash goes out, you guys. That's just the way this stuff works out here. But he goes like this. The, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and became, and we beheld his glory. That's what we did. We believe. Do you guys believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate? So Jesus is the Son of God that was born unto Mary, a virgin, by a miraculous birth. And he walked among us. He will not us here in this room, but he walked among humans here on this planet. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God man, walked. He did stuff, man. He he healed blind people. He, you know, eyeballs came back, arms that were all twisted and mangled. Whoop! He stretched them right back out. He raised people from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus came out of there sounding like a true V8 with a quadra jet on it. The Lazarus I raised did anyway. <laughs> but when it comes right down to it, the glory, so the, it says that, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's what Jesus is to us. I don't know if you know that yet, but that's what it is. It's grace and truth. The grace that he saved us. And he, he, he went to that cross for our salvation. The grace that he was able to have mercy on us, even though we don't deserve any of it, man. The grace that he allows us a place in his heaven, man, be, because we believed on his son. This is the grace. And the truth is, sometimes it's hard. Most of the time it's beautiful. And most of the time it's powerful and enlightening and refreshing and energizing. But sometimes the truth hurts a little bit, right? But look, if it didn't, it wouldn't be the stinking truth, man. It would just be Jesus rubbing people's butts. And he ain't no butt rubber, I'm here to tell you. He's going to tell you the truth so that between here and heaven, there's some growing that we're going to do here. There's some glorification that's going to happen in our lives, man. And we're going to get better and better at being shed boy our dangs, I'm here to tell you right now, man. And if Ed was here writing down Denverism, shed boy our dang would be on the list. Shed boy our dang. You got to... Dang, yeah, there you go. A little more emphasis on the dang part right there. Go to the last one over in Colossians real quick. Check this out. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So we're sharing this stuff. We're sharing our faith. We're sharing about Jesus. It's not about sharing mechanically or even technically because you've, you know Bible verses and things like that. It's about sharing emotionally from our hearts we love him we love jesus because he's worthy of our love he's done things to be worthy of our love he's proven himself over and over and over again to be forgiving and gracious and loving and long suffering amen and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful for all that stuff sometimes i don't know that we always are thankful I know that we're glad we're not going to hell, but are we thankful for all that comes with salvation? Or, or is it just truly a get out of hell card or fire insurance, you know, so you don't go to hell? Because if that's all it is to you, for one thing, you've missed a major big important thing here. And, and for another, I would question your salvation in the first place. If, if it's just a mechanical 
like a vending machine thing. You put a quarter in, you pull out salvation, like, okay, I got that. I'm sticking it in my back pocket. You have absolutely missed the relationship with Jesus Christ. 110%, man. And that's a dangerous thing to be playing with, man. You know what? When, when we give our life to Christ, that doesn't mean we're going to be flawless, right? But you know what? As we continue to grow in the Lord and grow in the Lord, we learn more and we get better at things. And we still make mistakes. Doesn't mean we got to keep making them over and over again, though. But you know what? I'm thankful for my salvation. And it's been a long walk for me. I don't know about you guys. I'm sure that you guys have had some struggles in your walk, too, as well as many, many victories as well. But I'm thankful for where I am today because I'm telling you right now, 25 years ago, I was not where I am today. I'm an entirely different person than I was 25 years ago. And, and that's, sometimes that's good and bad. I don't know. But nonetheless, he says, let, your word, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's the preparation. We're going all the way back to the beginning now. The preparation, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You've got to have it in you. You've got to read it. You have to spend some time there out of a desire to, though, out of a desire to have it in you, man, so that it's not something you have to try to, you know, write down on cue cards or something like that. You know, I, I, can, I can share a lot of things out of the Bible, and I have no idea where the address is, man. I have no clue, but I know that it's in this word right here, man, and I can, I can paraphrase the heck out of it pretty well pretty darn close. I know the stories, man, and that's the cool thing about it. That's the way I talk, and the way I talk, sometimes people can understand. Well, you know what? The way you guys all talk, the same thing, man. God's going to put you right face to face with people that speak your language, man, just like the day of Pentecost. All that stuff is relative, man. It all runs together, man. That wasn't a, that wasn't a mistake in the Bible or even something where you're like, ooh, all those languages they spoke, man, that, what a trip. Man, you know what? That's still happening today. You can go to a church somewhere, and you can listen to someone like John MacArthur. I've gone and listened to John MacArthur. I don't know what the heck he's talking about, man. I mean, I pick up the Jesus here and there and stuff, but he is so technical, man. He is just like way the heck over my head, man. And then you get someone like Greg Laurie, who's a very intelligent and anointed and gifted preacher, but I can understand everything that he's talking about, man. And my pastor tree broke it down in a language that I could truly understand. And that's how I fell in love with the Word of God, because God put me in front of a guy, and I understood the language that he was speaking. Amen. You guys have all that stuff, too. And he says here, with, sim with hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Because that's where it emanates from, right here. Your love for Jesus Christ. Not your obligation, necessarily, although we are obligated. But for the love that we have, the passion, the love, the burning that we have for Jesus, that we, sh we desire to do our best to get out there and present something to a lost and broken world so that they can have what we have as well. Because you look at these people, and if you're not heartbroken over some of it, I know they're irritating. I know when people are, you know, setting tents up around your neighborhood and they're bumming chains up like that, you know, you just sometimes you just feel like you got to run them over or something. That's not in the Bible. You'll never find that in there, man. And I know it's difficult because we got all kinds of stuff going on in our lives, and that's kind of like a, a really irritating acid kind of glass in the head kind of thing right there. But you know what? They're lost and broken, but, but don't get hung up on the homeless. You can go into any office building anywhere here in San Bernardino, and you find a lot of people just as lost and broken sitting inside of a $100,000 a year job they're just as messed up as those people in those tents out there by the freeway, you guys. But you have what it takes. They're starving for the Word of God. And we literally have a buffet. Amen? And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever we do, wherever we go to share our buffet, wherever we go to set up and all the preparation that we've been putting into all of our spiritual walk and our life, all the, the mixing of the ingredients and all this stuff that makes us who we are, individually and uniquely in Christ, that's who we are. We're his own personal little McDenver, so to speak. But I'm real, anyway. We go out and share that with the world because you are worthy to go out and share the word of God. Because you have been chosen by the King of Kings, not by me, man, 
You've been chosen, you've been instructed, you've been elevated, and you've been instructed by the King of Kings. There's no reason why anybody in this room should have any fear or concern about sharing their faith with, with anybody in the whole world. Anybody out there, man. Nobody. I know we all got our weird little fears. They might say we're weird or something like that. You've really got to get past that one. You guys are the weirdest of the weird. So that's done. You can take that one off the map right there, all right? I don't know enough. I beg to differ. I believe that you do know enough. I think that you're hiding behind some fear, or that, that's, that's hidden behind some fear, rather. But you do know enough. You know more than you, you, you probably know that you know more. Get past the fear. That's nothing but a lie from the pit of hell, man, that's holding you back and preventing you from going out there like a holy lunch truck, man, and just roaring out there into the world with a smorgasbord of good stuff. Amen? Here's the application night. <clears throat> we can find a Bible study in everything we do and be thankful every day. Every single day of your life. And I challenge you, you don't have to write them, all right? You don't have to, I'm not asking you to write Bible studies like that. Just throughout the next few days, the week or something like that, as we're going through Christmas, when things happen that you, you, know, you witness or you see or things happen to you, if you come across anything that's like, man, that reminded me, boom, of this passage or this story in the Bible, man, write it on an L kit and throw it in there so I can just read this stuff or come and tell me, man, because I'm here to tell you right now, now that I've shared this with you, you're going to see Bible studies in all kinds of stuff in your life, man. From your children, your grandchildren, your job, the world, the news, going to the stinking market, putting gas in your car, buying clothes, whatever it is, you're going to see stuff start coming at you from every direction right now. And you know what? I encourage you, if that happens, even if you don't know the verse, just write it on a piece of paper so you don't, re you don't forget. Man, this reminded me of this thing in the Bible. Get a hold of me. We'll, we'll find it together, man. I, I'll find that passage for you, and we'll look at it. And I'll bet you that you're going to have a Bible verse that you're going to remember for the rest of your life and whatever that situation was as well. Amen? Because there's a Bible study in everything. From here to eternity, all we got to do is open our eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. Well, we do know that there's Bible studies and everything, Father. We thank you for your word of preparation, of feasting, Father, and of fellowship, and certainly of keeping Jesus in the forefront of everything that we do in our lives, Father, and, and our word and our deeds as well, Lord. And so tonight, Father, as we're kind of moving past Thanksgiving and moving into this awesome Christmas season here, Father, Lord, I ask that you open up opportunities for us, Lord, to share our faith out there. There's going to be lots of people out there. There's going to be Jesus everywhere right now, Lord. This is a great time for us to bring those meals out there, those, those spiritual feasts out there, Father. This is a time and I ask for divine appointments. And Lord, I pray that the enemy be removed from as far as the east as the west from anyone in this room here, Father, even out there in TV land, Lord, that, that the lies of the enemy are kept at bay, Lord, forced away, Father, that nothing stands between these people, their hearts, and those that you called them to minister to as we continue to move through these months here, Lord. Not our desires that everybody knows your son, as Savior. So tonight as we pray together as a family, Lord, we, we pray that somebody here, maybe someone out there in TV land has seen that table. They've seen the preparation. They know the ingredients that are in that meal. Every word that's written in this Bible here, Father. And Lord, they just know that they need to take a big heap and helping of that right now, Lord, and receive your son Jesus as Savior. So tonight as we pray, Lord, we ask that you allow them to Feast on your word, Father, and receive your Son in Jesus' name. Let's all pray. Father God, I sin against you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you to my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Take a big bite. Ah, right to the neck, the word. We're going to have some girls praying over there. You know, some guys praying over there. Come up and get some prayer. Don't be a squayer. And I will see you guys uh, Tuesday for another Isaiah. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen.